Lord, we do love you. Lord, we come to worship you, to learn of you. And Lord, how thankful we are for these few short minutes that we just set aside the cares and concerns of the day, for there are many, and focus on you, turning our hearts and minds and voices toward you to worship you. Lord, we're so thankful. We're so blessed. Lord, you've blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Lord, you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness in this present age. Lord, what more could we ask for? What more can we do but to come and praise you and worship you? Lord, wow, it's amazing. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you for this time. Bless it, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. And all God's saints say, amen, amen. amen. Please be seated. Amen and amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. Uh, last time we were together, we looked at a very familiar portion of Scripture in chapter 2, which, of course, dealt with Rahab and the two spies. Uh, we saw how Joshua had sent two spies across the river Jer uh, Jordan into Jericho. They, of course, went to Rahab, the harlot's house, where she subsequently hid them on her roof and facilitated their escape. They subsequently crossed back over the Jordan to the plains of Moab on the eastern side of the Jordan. And there reported back to Joshua. However, their report was a little lacking. Uh, there was no actionable intel whatsoever, uh, nothing about troop placement, troop movement, weaponry, no maps or layouts of the enemy encampments. So really their mission was a bust in many ways. However, they did accomplish one thing, they ended up saving a gal by the name of Rahab, the harlot, which becomes very important when we get to Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, because she's mentioned in the genealogical record of Jesus Christ. So a very familiar story. Now, now, we come to chapters 3 and 4, finally. Finally, the children of Israel are going to cross the river Jordan. They spent 430 years in Egyptian slavery, according to Galatians 3.17. They spent another 40 years in the wilderness, Hebrews 3.17 declares. And now, after 470 years away from the promised land, they're now ready to cross the Jordan into the promised land. Now, it only took us about five years from Genesis to where we're at now in Joshua. So be thankful it didn't take the whole 470 years for us to get this far, though uh, for some of you, it probably feels like it has been. Now, there's a few things we want to note in chapters 3 and 4 in dealing with crossing over the Jordan, uh, six in all. Number one, the first thing involves some information about the crossing in verses 1 through 4. In dealing with crossing over the Jordan, the first thing involves some information about the crossing. In verses 1 through 4, there are really three bits of information that we want to look at. The first thing involves obedience. Obedience? Yeah, look at verse 1. It's subtle, but it's here. In Joshua 3.1, it says, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. Now, back in chapter 1 of Joshua, verse 2, God told Joshua to cross over the Jordan into the promised land. And here we see his obedience, which becomes very important because at this point, Joshua had no plan to cross over. There were no 
details given to him about how he should cross over the Jordan or where. He had no information, no plan as it pertained to what he would do when he did cross over the Jordan. In fact, according to verse 15 of Joshua chapter 3, the Jordan was at flood stage. This was the first month of the Jewish year, the month of Nisan, March, April, it was in the spring. And the river Jordan was overflowing its banks. And yet with all of this, no plan, no information about the future, the river overflowing, Joshua was obedient to the Lord. God said, Joshua, go. And Joshua went. In fact, according to verse 1, it says he rose early in the morning to go. You know, as I thought about that for a moment, I thought about the obedience of Joshua, even though he didn't have the whole picture. He had no information about Jericho, about his enemies. He had no idea how he was going to cross the, the swollen Jordan River at this point. He had no direction as it pertained to what he would do when he got into the promised land. God just simply said, go. And he went. And I think the simple point for us is that Joshua had a choice to make. He could choose A, to obey God, or B, disobey God. It's pretty, you know, God has made life pretty simple for us, hasn't he? I mean, when you think about it, it's pretty simple. God said, do this, and we have a choice. We can be obedient or disobedient. Now, I think many of us desire to be obedient to the Lord. Okay, four of you up front, good. <laughs> now the problem we have is that after we make the right choice to obey God, is that we have a tendency to try to be obedient in our own strength, in our own efforts, in our own energies. And unfortunately, we end up failing miserably. Oh, we might start off with a bang. We might do pretty good for a little while. But you know, we fall back into the old ways. Why? Well, because we're trying to do it in the flesh. Now, the good news is once we make that decision, that choice to obey God, once we change our mind, now God is able to change our heart. And then we realize that being obedient to the Lord is something we really can't pull off in and of ourselves, that we need help. So we end up turning to the Lord and crying out to God, saying, God, I can't do it. And God looks down from heaven and says, I know. But now you know which is the key. Because that's a display of humility recognizing our inability to be obedient to what God's called us to do. And when we recognize that deficiency we have in our own lives, now all of a sudden as we turn to the Lord, as we cry out to the Lord, He gives us the ability, the enablement, the empowerment to be obedient. How? Well, it's by His grace. It's God's grace that empowers and enables us to do what God tells us to do. In fact, Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 5, he said that we've been given grace and apostleship for obedience unto the faith. So verse 1 becomes very, very important as it pertains to this information about the crossing because it involves obedience. Number two, the, the second bit of information about the crossing involves patience. Patience. Look at verse two. It says, so it was after three days that the officers went through the camp. Now, they just left Acacia Grove which is in the plains of Moab, east of the River Jordan. It is seven miles from the river. So presumably, it took all of the children of Israel three days to travel that seven miles, if you will, and to prepare themselves 
for the balance of the information that they're going to get. But what I found very interesting is it says it was after three days. I mean, you can just picture the children of Israel. Here they are at the bank of the River Jordan. Man, you can see the promised land. It's just across the river. And they're thinking, you know, Lord, we've waited 470 years, and now three more days? Follow me? I mean, I get impatient after a couple of hours. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, you know, Lord, it's, it's about time, isn't it? I mean, you know, you can do your work any minute now. But God doesn't always work that way. Sometimes he draws things out. Three more days? Yeah, three more days. Why? Well, I think God allows these things to happen in our life to develop patience in our lives. Question. How does God grow or develop patience in our lives? Are you ready for this? It's through trials. It's through tribulation. Read James chapter 1, verse 3. The Bible says the testing of our faith develops patience. I had a fellow come into the office and he was complaining about his lack of patience. He's so impatient with everybody, his, his wife, his children. His, he's just very impatient. He said, Pastor, can you pray that God gives me patience? Now, I like the guy. So I explained to him what he's really asking for. And at the end of our conversation, he says, well, okay, I, I, maybe we can skip praying for patience. Because it does come through the testing of our faith. And we often wonder, why does God test us? Three more days, really, Lord? Why? Because I want you to grow in patience, in perseverance. Now, there's a third bit of information that we're given here in verses 3 and 4, and it's about the ark. It's about the ark. Look at verses 3 and 4. It says, and they commanded the people, now you got the picture, they're all there at the banks of the river Jordan, they're all gathered around, and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests and Levites, bearing it, carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Follow the ark. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure, or about 3,000 feet. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not yet passed this way before. Now all the people are gathered around. They're at the River Jordan. They're ready to cross over. And Joshua says, okay, the Ark of the Covenant is going to go before you. In fact, it's going to be about 3,000 feet ahead of you. Now, the Ark of the Covenant represents the, the dwelling place of God. You remember that gold box inside were the Ten Commandments, that golden jar of manna, as well as Aaron's budding rod eventually, according to the writer of the Hebrews. And it had the two angels, the cherubim on top, the wings were touching over the mercy seat. You all familiar with the Ark of the Covenant? It represented God or the dwelling place of God. Now clearly they had to stay far away from the Ark of the Covenant because it was holy. It represented God. And the children of Israel couldn't really get near God in that tangible sense. But also, according to verse 4, it's so they could see very clearly. Joshua said, stay far back away so you can see where it's going, so you can follow it because you've not passed this way before. But the whole point here is very simple. According to the end of verse 3, they were to go after it. <laughs> go after it. Now, you got the picture. The ark represents... God. They were to go after God. Why? Because it was God who was going to go before them and lead, guide, and direct them into the promised land. And I'll tell you what, this is a great word for us. To go after God. Man, seek the Lord. 
be directed by the Lord. That we would just follow Jesus. Man, follow his teachings. Follow his example. Follow his life. Being led and guided by God. What a beautiful bit of information. Well, uh, back to Joshua chapter 3. Let's come to the second thing we want to look at. We said there were six. Uh, The first thing involves information about the crossing. The second section deals with the sanctification for the crossing. In verses 5 through 11, the children of Israel were to sanctify themselves, consecrate themselves, purify themselves. Take a look. In verse 5, it says, And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So before crossing the Jordan into the promised land, Joshua tells the people to sanctify themselves. We might say to purify yourself, consecrate yourself, set yourself apart for the Lord before entering the promised land of the Lord. And this becomes very significant because the the battle that lies ahead with the children of Israel involves spiritual preparation, not a military operation. In fact, that is why the Ark of the Covenant, God himself, if you will, was to go before them into the land. They were to prepare themselves spiritually. In fact, look at verse 6. It says, Then Joshua spoke to the priest saying, take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to magnify or exalt you in the sight of all Israel. And we'll talk more on that in just a moment. That they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priest who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Gergesites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now you got the picture. Guys, we're getting ready to enter into battle against all of these Ites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Parasites, the Pilophites, the Mosquito Bites, man, all the Ites. We're going to go to battle before them. But it is the Lord that's bringing you in for this battle. So they were to prepare themselves spiritually because this would be a spiritual battle. And what was true for the children of Israel is equally true for us. Because you and I are engaged in spiritual warfare. There is a spiritual battle that's going on today. And it's really being fought on two major fronts. The first spiritual battle is external. There's a battle externally, we would say. Paul said in Ephesians 6, 12, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Make no mistake about it. The devil is real. His demons are his henchmen. And they are out there throwing those fiery darts at you, at me. Satan's out there roaring like that lion, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 7 and 8 declare. And the battle is real. And this battle, this external spiritual battle, is fought on our knees. 
That's why prayer is so incredibly important. I love it that we have prayer here at the church every Sunday morning before first service. We get together and we pray for the Sunday services, what's going to go on here that particular day. Pastor Manny leads the prayer Sunday afternoon before fourth service. That's open to the whole congregation to come and be prayed for, to be anointed with oil, uh, to lift up personal matters or issues or the church, our government, praying for everything and everyone. And then, of course, Thursday night at 7 o'clock, also the prayer group meets. It's open to the whole congregation to come and pray because this spiritual battle we are in is fought on our knees. So in one sense, there is a spiritual battle externally. But there is a second front this spiritual battle is being fought, and that is internally. Internally, oh yes. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible says that the flesh wars against the spirit. Now you and I, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, are made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. The body is the flesh. The soul is our consciousness, our awareness, our ability to think and reason. The spirit is that which God has given to us. Now the flesh... And the spirit that dwells in us, Romans 8, 11, Acts 5, 32, is fighting. They're warring against each other. What's the battle for? Our soul, our mind, our consciousness. So there is this internal battle that's raging in all of us. The flesh versus the spirit. And as we've said on previous studies, that's why it's important for us to feed the spirit. I realize I'm preaching to the choir. You're all here today feeding the spiritual aspect of who you really are. Because ultimately, whatever we feed gets strong. If we feed the flesh with fleshly things, the flesh gets strong. And the flesh takes over our mind, our thought process. And eventually, what's in our mind comes out of our hands and our actions. But as we feed the spirit the spiritual aspect of who we really are. The spirit now gets strong. Now the spirit takes over our thought process. Now we're taking these other thoughts into captivity. And now we're thinking spiritually. We're thinking on spiritual things. And now that is realized in what we do in our actions. Therefore, this whole picture that's being painted here of being sanctified, set apart, consecrated becomes very important for all of us because just as the children of Israel were preparing for spiritual warfare, so too do we. Well, back to Joshua chapter 3. Let's come to a third thing we want to look at in dealing with this crossing, and that is the miracle of the crossing. The miracle of the crossing. Look at verses 12 through 17. In verse 12, it says, Now therefore, take for yourself twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off and the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan, with the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priest who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, uh, the city that is beside Zaratan, about 15 miles north. So the waters that went down into the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, or we would say the Dead Sea, failed, and they were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. 
Then the priest who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Wow. Finally. <laughs> It's been a long time, and now they made it to the other side. Talk about the miracle of the crossing. This was miraculous to be sure. In many ways, but one of which that's mentioned here is we're told it was the time of harvest. Now, this is the springtime, March, April. During the first month of the Jewish religious or sacred calendar, the month of Nisan. Now, during this period of time, Mount Hermon to the north, it's about 9,200 feet above sea level, it's snow-capped. The snow is melting into the ground, bubbling up through three major headwaters. Uh, one, of course, is the Banyas there at Caesarea Philippi. Uh, another one, of course, is the Dan, and then the third being the Hospani, one that's uh, a little less known. And these headwaters are raging. The Jordan River is filled to overflowing so much that the banks are actually overflowing into the low-lying areas. So what does God do? He miraculously parts the Jordan. Just like he parted the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 14. And all of Israel crossed on dry land. But what I think it is important to note here is that the waters did not part until the priest put their foot into the water. Don't miss that. Now, you got the picture. Here are the priests with the ark. They're standing right at the river's bank. The river is raging, it's flowing, it's overflowing. They saw the raging river and they literally had to take a step forward into the water. The Bible's very clear. It's when their foot touched the water, that's when it parted. And this is a beautiful picture of what we call a step of faith. <laughs> because chances are a lot of us have some raging rivers in our lives. Chances are, we see a lot of issues and a lot of problems that face us. And they seem like it's an impossible situation. The river is just flowing too fast, it's too full. There's no way I can get across that thing. And yet Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that we are to walk by faith, not by sight. It is so easy for us to get our eyes off of the Lord and on to our circumstances. We see our circumstances, our situations, we see that raging river ahead of us and we begin to freak out. Is it no wonder Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, 4, 18 that we're not to look at the things that are seen, but rather look at the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Look, I get it that our situations are real. And I understand that, that they're huge and, and overwhelming, believe you me. But at the same time, we understand that God's on the throne. And there isn't anything too hard for the Lord. Man, if he can part the River Jordan, if he can part the Red Sea, and cause the children of Israel to cross on dry land, don't you think he can take care of our little circumstances and situations? The Bible says, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> he hasn't changed. And if he could do miracles then, he can do miracles today. The question is, are we going to walk by faith in light of that? Just like the children of Israel. Well, let's come to a fourth matter. We have to hurry. The fourth thing involves a memorial to the crossing. A memorial to the crossing. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, 
God instructs them to set up a memorial. Take a look. In chapter 4, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourself twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst, or the middle, of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight, there into the promised land. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder. So these are big stones according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, 12 in all that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever." And the children of Israel did so just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones from the midst of the Jordan as the Lord had spoken to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them to a place where they lodged and laid them down there in the promised land. Then, verse 9, Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood and they are there to this day. The day of course when this book was written. Now they're dealing with the memorial to the crossing. There were actually two memorials. One that God instructed them to do and that's to take the 12 stones out of the River Jordan where they crossed, stack them up on the land in the promised land as a memorial stones of remembrance to the mighty hand of God, to the power of God, and to the promises of God in bringing them into the promised land. And for whatever reason, according to verse 9, Joshua set up 12 more stones, this time inside the river. Why? I don't know. simply probably to mark the place of the crossing in his own heart because of course the stones would be covered with water momentarily. But the point here is there is a memorial to the faithfulness of God, to the power of God, to the fulfilled promises of God. And I think it's good to have memorial stones in our lives, something touchable, something tangible to remind us of God's fulfilled promises so that we would remember how powerful God really is. You know, I love the fact that out in the foyer we have those um, photo albums dating back some 17 years. A gal here at the church who does those kind of things and Sally were putting these together and I thought, you know, that's a great idea. Why don't you put a couple more together? And they made two or three of those photo albums, you know, with times and dates and, and pictures and it's just neat to look back at God's faithfulness, how God has brought us so far as his people, the children of God. And it really brings great hope as we look back at these stones of remembrance to see the faithfulness of God in the past, knowing he's going to continue to be faithful in the future. Well, number five, let's come to a fifth matter. We said there were six. And the fifth thing involves magnifying Joshua after the crossing. Magnifying Joshua after the crossing. Uh, That's in verses 10 through 18. Take a look. In verse 10 it says, So the priest who bore the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished, that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. And the people hastened and crossed over. Then it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over that the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed over in the presence of the people and the men of Reuben 
The men of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses had spoken to them. Remember, these two and a half tribes would stay on the east side of the Jordan, but in Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, they were going to come and fight with the children of Israel, and here, of course, they did. About 40 thousand prepared for war crossed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord magnified Joshua or uh, exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. And they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. Now, back in chapter 3, verse 7, we read that God was going to magnify or exalt Joshua. Here he does. And this magnification or exaltation of Joshua is really the confirmation of God's anointing in Joshua's life. That Joshua would be the man to replace Moses and to become the new leader of the children of Israel. And I think this becomes very important because here we see a beautiful principle set for us. Because Joshua did not exalt himself to be a leader. He didn't appoint himself to be a leader. He was anointed by God to be a leader. You know, I like how Pastor Chuck puts it. He said, man appoints, but God anoints. It's easy for us to appoint ourselves to a place or a position of authority or leadership or power. But it's a different thing when God anoints you to do it. When God exalts or magnifies you, raises you up to a place to serve him. You say, well, Clark, how do I know if I'm appointed or I'm anointed? Oh, you'll know. And so will everyone else. <laughs> If you're truly anointed to do that, it's going to be smooth. It's going to be easy. It'll be fun. It won't be work. It won't be toil. It won't be sweat or effort. And other people aren't going to come up to you and say, Brother, please don't do that anymore. You clearly are not gifted in that area. Please stop. You're making all of our lives very miserable. It becomes very obvious to us and to others when the appointing versus the anointing actually happens. Because when God does call you to do it, he's going to equip you. And there's going to be inspiration, not perspiration. Big difference. Well, this section goes on. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Command the priest who bear the ark of the testimony to come up from the Jordan. <clears throat> Joshua therefore commanded the priest saying, come up from the Jordan. And it came to pass when the priest who bore the ark of the Lord, a covenant of the Lord, had come up from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priest's feet touched the dry land that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and flowed over all its banks as before. Now don't miss the picture here. The priest's were the first ones into the river. And here we see the priests are the last ones out of the river. The priest went before the people, and then the priest followed after the people. Because the priests were to be servants of the people. And here I think we see a beautiful picture painted for each and every one of us. Because as servants of the Lord. We too are called to serve others. And I can't tell you what a blessing it is here at the barn to see so many brothers and sisters who get here early. Before the rest of us get here, they set up, they prepare, make sure everything's in order. And then after we leave, they stay and clean up, pick up and lock up. <laughs> and we come back again on Sunday and everything's perfect again. Now, can you imagine having these, this many people in your house twice a week? Y'all a messy bunch, I got to tell you. <laughs> and here we see that beautiful picture being painted. Really an example of Jesus Christ. 
Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 says he's our high priest and yet he set that example of what it means to be a servant in Matthew 20, 28. Son of man didn't come to be served but to serve and to give his life as that ransom for many. Beautiful picture being painted for us. Well, let's come to the sixth and final thing and we'll wrap this up right here. The sixth thing involves the time of the crossing. Number six, the time of the crossing. That's in verses 19 through 24. Take a look. In verse 19 it says, Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month. And they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho, maybe just a mile and a half east of Jericho. Now here we see the time of the crossing, which becomes very significant. It was the 10th day of the first month. Now remember, it's the month of Nisan, March, April. And according to Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, the tenth day of the first month is exactly the day that the Passover lambs were being picked to be sacrificed on the fourteenth day of Nisan. And this is exactly the same day that Jesus Christ triumphantly rode into Jerusalem, fulfilling Psalm 118.24 that says, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So the time of the crossing becomes incredibly significant. It is the exact same day that Jesus Christ triumphantly rode into Jerusalem and the Passover lambs were being procured for the slaughter. So all of this really points to and speaks of Jesus Christ. Because while it's true Joshua brought the people into the promised land, Joshua could never give them rest. So this really is, is looking forward to Jesus Christ who will give them rest. Read Hebrews chapter 4 verses 8 through 11. Well, in verse 20 it goes on, it says, and those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal, there uh, very near Jericho. Then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until he had crossed over, coming out of Egypt, of course, that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Now we've talked about the stones of remembrance. They're mentioned here. We've talked about the mighty hand of God parting the water. It too is mentioned here. But note carefully, class, all of this remembering is to be given by the Father to their children. This is an important precept, a, a great principle for us because it was the fathers that were to teach their children about the mighty hand of God and the crossing of the Jordan as well as the Red Sea. Mom, Dad, teaching our children about Jesus is our responsibility. We can't leave it up to the church. We can't leave it up to the Sunday school teacher to private Christian schools, or any other person or group. Yes, the church, Sunday school, private schools, they all reinforce and confirm everything we as parents should be teaching and training our children regarding. In fact, Paul goes on to tell us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, he says, Fathers, do not provoke your children under wrath, but train them up in the admonition and nurture of the Lord. It's our job, it's our responsibility to tell them about Jesus. Father, how thankful we are for your word. Lord, for the great privilege that you've given us that we can come and study your word. Lord, that we can learn of you, that we in turn can 
teach our children about you. And Lord, we are thankful for all of those who reinforce these glorious truths to our children, our wonderful Sunday school teachers who love these kids, who teach them and feed them, the private Christian schools that you've raised up to receive these children. Lord, the different Christian events that are happening. Lord, we thank you for that reinforcement, but Lord, how we pray that you would strengthen our hearts and hands as parents, as grandparents, to be those to teach and train up our children. Lord, that we, like the children of Israel, would walk by faith, not by sight. Even though the river's raging, Lord, give us that faith to take one step, to put our foot in, to see your miraculous hand work in our lives. So, Lord, we just cry out to you for your Holy Spirit, your great grace, to be poured out in our hearts, enabling, empowering us to be those who truly walk by faith, to be obedient to your commands by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you're here today and if you need prayer for anything at all, after service, the pastors will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, just to minister to your hearts, your lives. And I do pray that God's Spirit would continually fall afresh upon each and every one of your hearts, strengthening you, encouraging you, guiding you. Man, as you go after Him. <laughs> God bless you guys. I love you. Next week, chapter 5, read ahead as we see the preparation for the Battle of Jericho. God bless you guys. <laughs>